remarkable, humbling, beautiful, extraordinary. <laughs> happy to be here. In fact, I'm just going to start because people in the bathroom probably can hear me. I'll, I'll speak up. My name is Suzanne Finder, and I am privileged uh, to host some real course luminaries here in this house with Suki, who is right there. This is uh, Suki's home. Uh, we've been housemates for seven years and friends for, we think, about 15. Um, I did a little research. I, I really haven't been tuned into David very much. Um, I was introduced to the course, uh, I think, about eight years ago. And David just came on my radar recently. Um, but we have some great friends in the ACIM community, and we love hosting. So I learned a couple of things about David. First of all, he was introduced to the course in 1986. He had just graduated, gotten his uh, master's in psychology, and was at a retreat with uh, Carl Rogers, trans personal psychology. Mm -hmm. All right. Memory is a little bit intact. So that was in 1986. Now, what I got from his website was when he first started reading the course, he spent eight hours a day or more reading it. I found that remarkable. I could barely read a few sentences. <laughs> right? um, so not soon after that, not long after that, David started hearing Jesus as thoughts. And it would just be stream of consciousness, correct me at any time. So I'm just getting this from your website. <laughs> and Jesus would answer and tell him all of these practical, well, here's what to do in this situation and that situation, whatever it was. And only after about two and a half years of studying the course, David got a calling to go out far and wide to talk about it. And what he realized was happening was that Jesus was starting to talk through him which is also so remarkable. Um, and the primary thing that David got was that he was to become as a child. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today, is that deep development of trust. So we too can recognize that voice within us that is already there, how to let go trust and be as one with Jesus, with all of our brothers and sisters, and with all that is. And the last thing I'm going to share with you this morning before I introduce David, and actually I want to introduce one more person, Gabrielle, before David gets started, is that enlightenment in this lifetime is possible. Now, the Course says it takes a little willingness, but I submit it's going to take a whole lot of willingness. And David, to me, is the demonstration of that, of that deep commitment, that deep willingness. And David talks about this in his new book, This Moment is Your Miracle. Good morning, everyone. And that is available for purchase with cash, $17, in the basket. A little bit more of housekeeping for those of you who are just walking in. There are two restrooms. Um... And you can come see me if you can't find them. There's tea. Put a lid on it in the kitchen. And I'm just going to have Gabrielle, who introduced me to David, say a word or two. And thank you so much for that introduction. Mwah, mwah. We're going to have an amazing time today, people. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have many official words. I'm just so thrilled to see you all here. I mean, it touches me deeply that you take time and that we join here together. And um, I'm just so grateful also, Suzanne, that you picked up on, on my idea. My, I re it really felt strongly guided, like, David, come, you know, come. I'm on it. I want to get this guy here, you know. <laughs> Because I know Suzanne, and maybe she's on it, and, and can, uh, can uh, um, just do the practical organization. So I have deep, deep gratitude for you, and for all of you, and then for you coming and answering that, that call you. to come. Thank, Thank you, you so much, and I'm excited to just have this day together. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, very good. Well, Svava has actually been taking down about 60 songs from Jesus. He gives her songs, lyrics, uh, using technology, all kinds of instruments, many instruments, and professional recording studio, and so she just uh, just released an album, and so she is going to <laughs> sing a song, actually, that just came very recently, too, and I said, that's got a really good tune to it. I said, wow, Jesus is going to start <laughs> hitting the charts with uh, songs like this, uh, your catchy tunes, you know, the kind of like the Beatles and all the ones that we mm -hmm. carry around with us, that like the jingles and the songs we sing in our hearts, so... So she's going to open up our gathering today with a song called Bring It Back from her. It's not on the new album. No. Um, but Divine Essence is the new album of 14 songs. But this, this one just trickled in from Jesus and I, I thought it sounded like such a cool tune. I said, play that one to start things off for us today. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you, David. Yeah. Oh, thank you, David. Thank you, David.
picked up the guitar last May for the first time, and now the Spirit is playing music through you, and you're doing public gatherings, and wow, yeah. it's pretty fast. <laughs> 60 songs and the guitar. And, yeah, and an album. And an album, yeah. Yeah. So it's a good example of just how when we really just give our life over and we just say, okay, you use me, then we even have like latent skills and abilities that just come out so effortlessly. Um, it's so different from our model where we feel like we have to learn everything. It just seems so long. When we think about learning and feeling deficient in this world and doing in seminars and in services to keep up our skills and you know almost like a pressure a learning pressure to be able to relax and say wow if I just tune in then I've already got everything within my own mind my own consciousness to to extend everything that I need to extend as part of my mission here I can take the pressure off I don't have to measure up to the standards of the world or compare myself to other people, I have everything. And that seems to be the way it is with spiritual awakening because um, many people come to the Course and, and it's quite, it's a quite a big book and it's quite, uh, people find it difficult to really grasp and to put into practice. Although a friend of mine, Frances, she told me after she traveled with me and watched me over a number of years, she said, I, I knew it. I knew that you had a deep awareness and, a, and a, a vibrational alignment with this Course in Miracles before you even came here, before you read the first um, word off of the page. She said, I, you, you were somehow very ready. It's like I knew you knew it before you picked it up to read it. And I said, yeah, I think that was the way, because even when I would read for eight hours, I used it pretty much as an oracle uh, mm -hmm. in those early years of just praying and formulating questions and then opening the book. Mm -hmm. And then the answer would always come. And then that stream of thoughts that uh, we were just hearing about, that came in very strong. And then I could go to the library, I started seeing messages on bumper stickers, billboards, turn on the radio, there was answer. I mean the answer is, it's like Jesus was saying, oh I, I can reach you in many, many ways. But with this course it's just a very direct pathway to God. So for me, I have to say it's beautiful coming here because uh, this is like a reunion in one sense, because I, it was 33 years ago where I first had the course come into my hands in La Jolla. Oh I came out from Cincinnati, and even though I've traveled around to 44 countries and I've shared these ideas in cities and rural areas and on six different continents, I am now back at the spot where it started 33 years ago, where I felt a strong call to come out to an association of humanistic psychology, AHP conference, uh, with Carl Rogers and Virginia Satir, a lot of humanistic psychologists, transpersonal psychologists. And I have to say when I landed out here and I first went out to the ocean and smelled that salt breeze blowing in. I was used to a muddy river in Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> uh, so when that, that ocean that sparkly blue ocean, bright blue sky, that salt breeze blowing in. It was like that was the Spirit giving me a symbol like, your life is about to take on a new trajectory. You are about to change in your awareness from anything you could ever possibly imagine or even fantasize about. And, and that's the feeling I had when I was out here, when I went to, to this conference of psychologists and was drawn down into this area where people were selling their books and their tapes and CDs and so forth. And I was drawn to the end of the room, there was a video playing of a Course in Miracles teacher from India, a Sikh man named Tara Singh. And it was just a video playing, but I, I stood there just mesmerized for probably 15 or 20 minutes and just was like, the words that were being spoken were like touching my soul, like, oh I know this, I know what he's speaking about. And two of his students were there and they were selling A Course in Miracles 
and they had one of his books, uh, Nothing Real Can Be Threatened, with a beautiful cover on it, and then one of Ken Wapnick's books, uh, Forgiveness in Jesus. So I, I took about all three, and I had the course in my hands for the first time 33 years ago. And so it's beautiful to come out here again, and actually, even though I've, I've met friends of mine who have taken the course all over the world from this area, the Luckets, actually were, people don't know much about them, but they were actually Bill Thedford's teachers. Uh, he, they're not written up so much in the history books, but they live down here in Southern California, and Bill Thedford, everyone knows his work with Helen Shuckman, the scribe, that was all in New York City, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. Then when he moved to Northern California to be with Jerry Jim Polsky and Judy Scutch and a lot of amazing people back then, he actually left Northern California at one point and his final big move of his life was to move down here to live with the Luckets mm -hmm. down here. Mm -hmm. and the Luckets were known for their joy. Mm -hmm. the Eulalia Luckett was such a joyful woman. The first time I met her was in Sedona and uh, Jack Luckett was, uh, <clears throat> he was retired military and she, they were sitting there with their little baseball caps on, with a huge following down in Sedona, teaching, and then uh, they did a lot of experiential work. Uh, they did work on undoing beliefs around sexuality, all kinds of things that I think, they were like forerunners that even the teachers today hadn't really touched upon it. They were very much into the experience, into living the Course, and then I saw them take a whole crowd, and where are they going? I started following. They were taking them down to a creek bed to do baptisms in the red creek bed of Sedona. I said, this is not like any course teacher I've ever seen before, <laughs> or since. <laughs> and then as I was walking down there, I had never met you lately, but she was among the crowd, and, and all of a sudden this woman swooped up beside me and planted the biggest <laughs> kiss on my cheek. As I was walking down the creek bed, as I looked, it was Eulalia. This woman was bursting joy, and she's very spontaneous, and she had no, she had no embarrassment about hiding her, her great joy. And the Course is about joy. The Course is about reaching that, that joy. That's one of those characteristics of a teacher of God. So, when I finally re met them years later in Honolulu, Hawaii, where they live, um, they kept talking about San Diego. They had done most of their teachings, even though they took the Course all over the world to many different continents, they were teachers of the Course way back uh, here, and they were kept talking about San Diego. David, have you been to San Diego? I said, well, actually that's where I found the Course, but have you been back there? You've got to go to San Diego. <laughs> These teachers never forget their home base. <laughs> and so there they were when I met them, about 85, they're 85 years old. Uh, they kept talking about San Diego, you got to go back to San Diego. So here it is. I've made it back to San Diego here, 33 years later. And I had some friends with me too who were kind of fascinated asking them questions and um, they said, are you still practicing the Course? They said, oh yeah, we, we're still loosening from these past associations, from familiarity, from, from the past. You know, at 85 years old, working with the Course, married, many people who are with the Course don't stay married or together very long. They've been together for decades, practicing the Course. And my friend Jason said, can you give me an example? How are you practicing the Course on a daily basis? And they said, well, we, when we go to sleep at night, imagine 85 years old, practicing the Course for decades, we always switch, we sleep on opposite sides of the bed, because we don't get, want to get too familiar with a side of the bed. We want to be spontaneous, and we want to not have a my and a your. In fact, um, years ago, I was in Cincinnati and I was going around teaching, meeting people in Cincinnati, Ohio, kind of known as a pretty conservative town, Course in Miracles groups, and I met this priest from, uh, when I was in Cincinnati, John Seiler, and he even wanted to travel around with me, but anyway, one day he said, 
yeah, David, he said, I'm, a, I'm a really struggling with the Course, and I'm a priest, and I'm working it as hard as I can. And he said, but I decided, I, said, I heard Bill Thedford was out there in Southern California, so I went out to find him, and I went out to San Diego, and I said, well, how did it go? And did you find him? Oh, yeah, he was out there. Did you go to the Course group? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I have never seen a Course group like that in all my days. I said, well, tell me about it. what's going on. And he said, we went out there. They were having this course group in San Diego, and the facilitator, uh, Eulalia Luckett, pulled her blouse off and taught the course group. And here's my friend who's a priest. He said, my eyeballs were just sticking out. He said, I could hardly concentrate. <laughs> California, Southern California, I've never heard a course group, she just whoop, off with her top. So he told me, this. so years later, many years later, I'm over in Hawaii and I'm saying, I'm with Eulalia, she's all dressed, has a purple hat on, she's dressed from purple from head to toe, her joyful self. He said, well you know I had a friend, a priest friend who came out here years ago, he told me this story, he said, oh yeah. Wasn't that a time? I have to tell you the full context. I said, yeah, please do. <laughs> I always get these little bits and pieces of stories, but I always like to hear the rest of the story. What is the context for this story? She said, well, I, Jack and I are practicing the course, and then it's hot. It was a hot, hot summer in San Diego, and they're practicing the course, and one day she goes to her husband, it's also facilitates the Course, and she says, it's so hot, and the Course is teaching us that we're spirit. The Course is teaching us that we're not bodies, and not to judge anything, and not to discriminate. We shouldn't be comparing between men and women, and here we are at the Course group, she tells her husband Jack. And all the men in the group, it's so hot that they're off with their tops. And this is a Course in Miracles group. You know, here's Pebbles coming up. <laughs> this is a Course in Miracles group, and we're supposed to be here teaching that unity is real, and differences are all of the ego, to not judge, to not compare. And she said, it's a hot day. I think, why shouldn't I be able to take my top off at a Course in Miracles meeting? So she asked Jack. Jack said, I'm going to have to pray on that one. <laughs> there was no immediate answer. <laughs> Jack, ex-military. <laughs> Speaking of hot, may I yes. just interject? If it gets warm today, which it probably will, will it will, um, feel free to open up those windows and bring in the air. Um, yeah, whenever you want. Beautiful, yeah. we'll be prepared. <laughs> She's given some options here. <laughs> so that was the context, you know, that they basically, uh, John happened to come to that particular course group of, of two or three days later, where uh, Jack had basically told you lately, I can't give you a good reason why not, you know, I know how much you want to practice the course and everything, but... He said, I, I really can't tell you there's a, there's a, a rational, guided reason to stop you. And so that was one of her experiences. It turned into a lot of forgiveness uh, opportunities, especially for my friend John, uh, the priest, who happened to be there. But uh, I would have to say that, that spiritual awakening is, is, is coming about to the present moment. Most of us have read The Power of Now, we've read enough about spirituality to know that there's something significant about the present moment. Mm -hmm. And then A Course in Miracles is no different, saying now is the only time there is, the, the past is gone, the future is but imagined. These concerns, the past and future, are but defenses against present change of focus. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful line from the Course, that we sometimes think of projection and denial and repression or sublimation, or all kinds of things as defense mechanisms, but we seldom think of the past and the future as defense mechanisms. They seem to be, it's almost like uh, telling a fish, you, you're in the water, and the fish has been in the water the whole time. It says, What's, what is water? <laughs> because 
there is no contrast experience. If all you know from birth has been time-space experiences, then for somebody to tell you you're an eternal being, it's like, mmm, sentimentally, I like that word eternal, but I don't actually have a lot of experience with eternity. And that's why we do have, um, we have atheists who say there is no God, we have theologians who go on pontificating about God and kind of in an anthropomorphic way, God's watching over you and the good things and God will judge you if you're bad and God will love you if you're good and all this stuff, which most of us are kind of like, I don't think that's really God, mm -hmm. uh, and who struggle with, with the with sometimes even the word God. I, I do a lot of talks and gatherings. I've even done six week retreats where people have these mind blowing experiences and then they, after six weeks with me in metaphysical movies and exercises and meditations and everything, they, their consciousness goes through so much of an expansion that it's hard for them to recognize the world when they leave. They kind of are looking at me like, what do I, do now with this new consciousness. And I said, well, all these other people you've been with, get, make a Facebook group or form a little community among yourselves that have gone through such a radical shift in consciousness, because you're going to need to be able to communicate and support, because it's, it's hard to relate, it's hard to go back to the past when you start to free your mind from it. It's very painful to try to go back and, and fit in or go where you once were before, because it's gone. You feel like you've transcended, you've lifted up higher. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, that uh, at the present moment, the reason it's so difficult for human beings to get in touch with the present moment is because they already believe that it's squeezed in between the past and the future. And the present moment isn't between the past and the future. Mm -hmm. The present moment is prior to time. That's why Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. There was actually a philosopher over in Germany. I always like to read Plato and all the great philosophers. And there was a, a philosopher in Germany and he basically, his name was Immanuel Kant. and. Immanuel Kant asked this philosophical question, which I think is probably the all-time great philosophical question, because I always like to read all the philosophical questions. But Immanuel Kant just asked this one question, he said, how do we know what we know? Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh. But he not only asked it, but he postulated that it had to be one of two things. Either we know everything before we come to Earth, we already know everything, and then we come and forget, and uh, we get caught up in the five senses and duality and everything. We either know before we come, or we know through our adventures here, which he, he called the five senses. And he postulated that we already know everything before we come. He called it a priori. And I thought, oh, there's this German philosopher who's just getting intuitively in touch with the teachings of Jesus. Before Abraham was, I am. Before time and space even seemed to be, I am. I am as God created me. Be still and know that I am God. That stillness, that pristine, perfect state of mind mm -hmm. is prior to the cosmos, prior to the Big Bang, prior to anything that was ever experienced in time and space. It's what spirit is. It's prior. And then people get into issues about, well, what caused the Big Bang? You might say that it's an, it's an explosion. The Big Bang was an explosion of, of gases that <coughs> solidified and so on and so forth, but it's separation. Mm -hmm. The ego is the belief. It's almost like if you gave your Christ mind, your I amness, over to a puff of nothingness. <laughs> And it caused an explosion, seeming explosion, where it splintered and splintered, like a mirror that splintered into trillions and trillions and trillions of different pieces that we call 
planets and galaxies and stars and people and creatures and aliens and on and on and on. But the I amness that the, the Greeks talked about, know thyself, they were very deep and philosophical. The know thyself is prior to time. And the reason that there's so much difficulty in focusing and coming into the now and into the moment of where you touch upon eternity is because the ego has covered over this I amness with a lot of distractions, a lot of uh, attachments, a lot of things that, that the mind gets caught up in, in, like you might say, endless circles mm -hmm. of looking for love in time and space when it's prior to time and space. Mm -hmm. Now that is so radical, <clears throat> you know, to me, when I started not only studying the Course, but I started to study non-dual philosophies in, in India, the Vedas, and I started to look at in China they had non-dual philosophies, so non-dual teachings were not impossible to find. The Course wasn't the first on the planet of these non-dual teachings. They've been around for many, many centuries. But they're, they're very kind of hidden, or they're very esoteric, and for most people they, they were just covered over by all these the theologies, mm -hmm. religions, these thick theologies on how the separated, separation happened, and how you should be good, and here's all the do's, and here's all the don'ts. Mm -hmm. And if you do the do's, you go back to heaven, or nirvana, or whatever you want to call it, and if you do the don'ts, you burn in hell, or some version of entrapment. Mm. And then the Course is coming along, along with these non-dual teachings, and saying, no, it's, it's there, it's pristine, but it's prior to time. Mm. Then you start to look at your life, it seems to be your life in this world, and you start to realize, hmm, there's stresses, there's struggles, there's drama, there's emotions, all kinds of intense emotions there's worries, there's concerns, you can see that even if this is a puff of nothingness that was given power uh, like by believing in it, Jesus says you made the ego by believing it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. So, like in the Matrix, you know, when his friends visit him and knock on the door, follow the right rabbit, his friend says, to Neo, I think you need to unplug, is what he tells Neo. And then that was like the symbol of, of him starting to loosen his mind from the beliefs of the Matrix. He does go to the, to the bar, the loud bar. He does meet Trinity. He is introduced to Morpheus. And he, is, he does follow the White Rabbit to a, an experience of, of you are the one. And that one is transcendent, that one is not limited by the matrix in any way. Trinity tells him that, you know, when he's looking at this shop with the, whatever, the <coughs> Korean noodles, the good noodles, and she says, the matrix cannot tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. These past memories, these past associations, no matter how thick we've made them, no matter how much we've believed in them, they can never tell us who we are. Because that I amness is prior to time. <coughs> so that means none of the symbols of time, including an oracle in the matrix. You know, when, when he goes to see the oracle, <coughs> remember that scene where he's in there, Neo's with the oracle, and, and she's trying to give him time, and she says, no one can tell you that you're the one. He's there to visit the oracle, to see if she will confirm what Morpheus has said. But she says, no one can tell you that you are the one. You have to know it for yourself. You have to experience it. And then, when he doesn't have that experience himself, she said, you have to know it yourself, uh, she gives him some more time. She says, hold out your hands. She starts looking at the, his lines on his, his palms, giving him, a, buying him a little more time. And she says, open your mouth. And she's looking inside of his teeth, she's giving him more time. And then she waits for him to say, I'm not the one. And then all, she's just an oracle, she can just reflect back. Everything in time and space can only reflect what you have in your awareness, your consciousness. So she says, 
sorry, kid, you're looking for something. And he's like, what? She said, maybe something in the future. You see, she, it's a time thing. You're still looking to time to tell you who you are. But time was made to block you from knowing who you are. The ego invented linear time to block the awareness of I am that I am. I am one with God. That I am presence was blocked by the invention, the fabrication of linear time. Why is time an invention of the ego? How could time be used by the ego? The ego says you're guilty in the past, the present is a little blip that's ineffectual, you're not gonna, it's not going to help you one bit, and it's, the past rolls right over into the future, you will be guilty in the future. And it's not surprising then, some of us have grown up hearing this fire and brimstone, you know, you'll burn in hell, and in the end, you know, you're either taken up by God or you're going to burn in hell. All of this, even dualistic uh, punishment concept and God punishing, all comes from the belief in linear time. It's all the same defense, but we just didn't know that. Until now, you know, now we're here, able to hear these words and go, oh. So it's time is where the guilt keeps getting perpetuated over and over. Guilty in the past, we're told we can't change in the present, and then you're guilty in the future. And guilty in the future would mean there would have to be some consequence for all this guilt. And that's where this eternal hellfire concept came in. The ego invented its own God a punishing God, it invented time, it's doing everything to perpetuate itself and keep you from knowing who you are. As you begin to forgive though, then everything that you perceive starts to look different. Everything starts to lighten up. So for me, <clears throat> I was raised in Christianity, went to Bible school and so forth, but I but I, my heart didn't light up from that traditional Christian upbringing. I felt there was a lot of questions I had. I had a lot of questions about the Bible. I had a lot of questions about typical things. Sin, punishment. How could all this be part of a loving God? How could these things are irreconcilable in my mind? And there were things that seemed beautiful and loving from the New Testament and a few things I found in the Old Testament, but uh, I think I spent my 10 years of full time in university from 1976 to 1986, right before the course came, searching, meeting students from all over the world, listening to their views, expanding my perception beyond my blinders of what I thought was the truth, which is just really a bunch of beliefs. We all grow up with a bunch of conditioning, and then if you're insecure about your conditioning, you try to convince other people <laughs> that you've got the right way, and they know that doesn't work. You get into a relationship, that really doesn't work. <laughs> you know, we, we go through this human experience, and we start to realize, ah, things are not really working out very well here. Where is the harmony? Where is the lasting love? Where is the lasting peace? Where is that peace that passeth the understanding of the world, that will never go away? That has to be real. And we, there's something inside us that knows that that's true, but there's so much conditioning about this time-space identity. So, I had some very, very powerful experiences once I opened up to the Course. I was with it for eight hours a day, not consecutively. I mean, I would open it up and I would be so excited. When I would get my answer to my prayer, I would read it in the Course, and then I'd be reading on for probably another hour and a half, not being able to put the book down, like, as if the Spirit was speaking directly to me. And I was starting to quickly lose interest in the world, and all of the you know, achieve and build a self-concept and find your niche and carve out your niche and be successful. Those are the things we all typically, that's our programming, to be here and to succeed. 
And then the Course, I could feel, was taking me in a direction of simplicity. It was taking me deeper inward. And the more I used it as an oracle, and the deeper I went with it, that's when I could, I hit Jesus' train of thought in my mind, basically calling me to follow that and to relinquish everything else. And uh, for most people, when you're in university years, you, you, you're doing a lot of that for the future, you know. Why would you put yourself through so many exams, read so many books, take so many tests? Who would put yourself, anyone through that much unless you had some kind of carrot dangling in the future? <laughs> That's right, and then your advisors, your friends are all telling you the same thing. Yeah, instead of flipping burgers at McDonald's, you could have a career, and you need education. And, you know, we're like, yeah, that's, that sounds right. Especially if, if it's a huge group of people, your culture is all saying the same things. And the culture isn't saying, you are the holy, perfect child of God, you need to unlearn everything you've ever learned, you need to forget about education, career, forget about that. Just follow the Spirit within and you will wake up to your reality and you'll, you'll be the Savior of the world. Not in a personal Messiah sense, but you'll, you'll find happiness and joy and peace of mind and that kind of salvation. The, the, what you've always been searching for. So, when I came into the Course and started really going deep with it, I realized I had a decision to make. I had to either go all in which would probably take me there faster, or what I experienced is faster, or I could dilly-dally and try to bring the Course into the world. Make me more abundant, make me a better manifester, make me, you know, all the different things that the New Age is quite famous for, is using spirit to give yourself a better illusion. And, uh, and the Course, I think, when, the more I got into the Course, the Course was saying, why don't you instead <laughs> use the Course to find peace of mind, heal your mind, heal your perception of the fragmented world, find the unity, find the joy, find the happiness, and be the light of the world that I'm counting on you to be. Uh, it's like the Course, the presence of Jesus is saying, I need helpers. I need helpers to demonstrate this. This, this is not an intellectual Course. This is not a Course on the play of ideas. This is a course in actual experience. And I want you to have an actual transformation of consciousness where you, in the end, transcend everything. And you will seem to go along, and the world will get more surreal, the world will get more happy, more bright, and you'll notice you, you aren't holding grievances, you notice you'll feel lighthearted. Under the Holy Spirit's teaching, you will Travel light and journey lightly. I, that sounded good to me. Travel light and journey lightly. That's a, a, a beautiful thing to go for. But it was saying, and you have to do this wholeheartedly. You can't do it with compromises. You can't do it making exceptions. Even in the workbook, there's only two suggestions. You know, don't do more than one lesson a day, and as best as possible, try not to make any exceptions mm -hmm. to the lesson. Which ties right into the very first of the 50 miracle principles. There are no order of difficulties in miracles. So, you will never know that there is no hierarchy of illusions. You will never know that the world is an illusion until you see that there's no difference between uh, raising the dead and uh, easing yourself from, from some discomfort, some worldly discomfort. <coughs> There's no difference. There was no difference for Jesus casting out demons, raising the dead, bringing peace and lightheartedness and comfort and gentleness. It's all the same. It all emanates from God. And there aren't hierarchies, there aren't levels of truth. Truth is transcendent. It's the I amness that's beyond this world. That's what truth is. It's not, there are no relative truths. Mm. Everything but this I amness is false. So you can see that if you give yourself over to the Course, you're going down like Alice in Wonderland. You're like Alice 
jumping down the rabbit hole and you're in for a very deep experience. And when you give yourself over to this, of course the Spirit has to make things practical enough for you to be able to relate to them. So it's almost like if your mind believes it's in this dualistic cosmos of time and space, it's almost like spiritually the Holy Spirit and Jesus are like lowering a ladder down, <laughs> one of those rope ladders down into your mind, and they're going, grab on, grab anything, grab the bottom, grab the middle, just if that rope swings by and you see that rope, grab it. Almost like if you were, you flipped out of a, one of these cruise ships and you were bobbing out in the Atlantic Ocean, and somebody threw you a dinghy, or, or threw you a, a life preserver or whatever, and said, grab hold, grab the rope, grab the life preserver, grab something, because you are going to need a connection. You're going to have to grab onto something that can help you in order to get out of that water, or get out of that cosmic trick of time and space. And that's why even in the Course in Miracles there are metaphors, you know, it's one part said God weeps. You know, God actually doesn't weep. God, you know, doesn't have tear ducts and, and <laughs> spirit. But, but it's in there for those that have been so lost in the world that they read a little part in the Course that said God weeps and, and, and go, God cares about me. You know, they, that's even one of those little, that's like the bottom of the, the ladder grabbing onto a piece of rope that's off there. God weeps, ho oh, oh. ho! God cares about me. And then there's all kinds of metaphors in the Course that it, the, the deeper you go and the higher you go in consciousness, a lot of those metaphors that are more dualistic, that are still addressing you as if you're a body, it's still addressing you as if you're a separate person. Those are all in there. It's a beautiful, that's why it's so thick. It's got so many metaphors. It's a beautiful ladder, just, but still underneath it is the Spirit saying, grab hold, you know, something. And traveling to all these 40, 44 countries and six continents, I always have been in so many hundreds and thousands of course groups that I hear stories in different cultures and different people saying, oh, I, I got it into my house back in such and yeah. such, and then I use it as like a plant stand and a, <laughs> a doorstop. I mean, particularly the old, the first edition of the book was like three hardbound things, and oh my God, the stories of people, it, it fell off the bookshelf and hit me in the head, and you know, and you hear all these stories, which are quite humorous, but it's like, it, they're all stories of readiness. Like, this is a very, very deep, uncompromising path. But it doesn't help you until you're ready. I hear so many stories of how it, I came across it, I heard about it, I read other books, and I finally bought it, I couldn't stand it, I, I threw it in a box, and then ten years later, after so-and-so died, I was cleaning my attic or my basement out, and then lo and behold, oh, I must have been ready for it then. I had one friend who, who was actually suicidal. She was, she had, was into drugs, she was obese, she was in such denial, <coughs> such struggle, such defense, and everything, and she had two children, smaller children, and she just reached the point of, I can't take it anymore, and she did just cry out to God and just say, I can't live another day, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. Uh, unless you show me that you're there, I, I am going to kill myself. I don't, even with the children and everything, I'm just, I can't do this. And then she had a, a mystical experience where she, this light just came toward her and she was just engulfed in all this light and kept calling her name, truly believe, truly fly, you know, over and over. And she was like, just caught in this mystical experience that was just sparks of love and light just hitting her and hitting her came right after she said, if you're there, God, you better make yourself uh, known to me, because I'm going to kill myself. And then when that happened, she, she had been clinically depressed, but through that mystical experience, she came running down the stairs, and her children were used to her being clinically depressed. They saw her all lit up and in joy, and 
they start jumping up and down, and she's like, there is a God, there is a God, and it was this mystical experience turned her world and her mind around from deep depression, clinical depression, to hope, to a spark of hope. And she actually had a Course in Miracles book in her shelf, a bookshelf, but she couldn't read it. She was just gibberish before the mystical experience. Then after the mystical experience, she went back, she picked the book off the shelf, she opened it up and she was like, Oh my gosh, this is the answer. This is going to lead me to God. But, but she didn't have the readiness before, before that mystical. Some deep prayer in her heart, when she was facing suicide, just said, there has to be another way, there has to be, show me, show me that you're there. Mm -hmm. And with that request, everything. She's been in my life since that point. It, it, took, uh, it took some years after that to kind of start to get into the Course, have some mystical experiences, and then back in the early days, uh, I just was traveling around all over the country and had my cell phone on the, uh, on the internet, and so she found it. Mm -hmm. And uh, my phone rang, I opened my phone up, flip phone at the time, remember those old flip phones, and I, mm -hmm. hello, it wasn't even hello, there was no introduction or whatever, I just opened my phone, I heard this voice say, I want joy. That was the all oh, she said to me, the three words, I want joy. <coughs> and I said, I join you in that completely, even though I didn't know who I was talking to <laughs> other than myself. Uh, you know, always, but I just said, I join you completely. And then, so I've had a series of people over these last 33 years that, that have kind of, kind of said, I join you, I'm going to leave all behind of this world and I'm going to go all the way with this. And the Course even has a line in there, it says in the Course, this Course will be believed entirely or not at all. This isn't one of those horseshoes and hand grenade things where, you know, or those board games. Well, if you get close, you get some bonus points. Uh, this is about enlightenment. This is about waking up and knowing yourself. And that is not really a matter of compromise. You can't be enlightened and have a self-concept. The whole point of Buddha saying empty your mind was empty your mind completely. It wasn't empty your mind 90% or Here's my Buddha formula, 98% and you're close to nirvana. You know, it's, the Buddha was teaching about enlightenment. Jesus is teaching about enlightenment. Ramana Maharshi is teaching about enlightenment. The Course is teaching about enlightenment. There's still nothing like experience though that really draws you even deeper. Because what happened to me was I immersed myself so deeply in the Course I wasn't interested in A Course in Miracles career, I wasn't interested in writing books, I wasn't interested in conferences, seminars. I actually, uh, when I left university, I left it so completely that I went to live like Henry David Thoreau. Oh. I thought, I'm just going to do a Henry David Thoreau turn here in my life and go there to the woods with A Course in Miracles. <laughs> a Henry David Thoreau with a Course in Miracles. A Walden Pond and A Course in Miracles. So I went to a little, I got a little travel trailer, like 12 foot travel trailer, and I went down to the woods of Kentucky, uh, Corinth, which is interesting, and Corinthians, you know, is the one, is the passage from the Bible that says, you know, you, you know, you, we see in part now, but we will see. We were looking through a darkened glass, yeah. but we shall see. And I, I went there, and I took my course, and I prayed and meditated, and I faced so much darkness. And I, had, at the time, I had a girlfriend, and she said, "You're gonna what? You're gonna what? You're gonna live in the woods of where? Where <laughs> is this lake? Uh, in a travel trailer?" She was, and my, my parents were like, oh great, after 10 years of university, how wonderful. <laughs> You're going to chuck it all and uh, go live in the woods with your little Henry David Thoreau book and your, what is this Course in Miracles, crazy 
nonsense. You know, you, know, you can only imagine uh, with partner, uh, parents, and university professors. This was the school of rolling eyes. Everybody was had rolling eyes, except pebbles. Everyone else was like, just rolling their eyes like, oh, and he had such a promising life ahead of him. A good student, and all this promise, and to turn out to a really good human being, and then he chucks it all to go with A Course in Miracles into the woods. So, I did, and actually, uh, right around that time, too, and it came right after that, I went so deep with the Course that I would do these meditations. Some of you might have heard of Zen open-eyed meditations. I did eye gazing with a friend of mine back then, where I would just go with the Course and then I would sit across from her and we would just gaze. One time we went way off into the woods with a table and a couple of chairs and I did one of these open-eyed eye gazing meditations. And then suddenly the three-dimensionality of the world collapsed and it was just two-dimensional and then where her figure was, this blazing light just started streaming through the perception of the world and it grew bigger and stronger and then the whole world disappeared. I went with her three different times with open-eyed eye-gazing practicing the Course and then giving myself permission to just let go completely of perception, I went into revelatory experiences. I mean, the light that is beyond this world. I went right into the I Am Light that has nothing to do with this world. And that will convince you. Yeah. I mean, it, I actually when I would come back from the light, it would be a bit of a shock and fear to even come back into time and space. And people have talked about that with near-death experiences, I call them near-life, but they go into the light and then they come back and they're shocked. Why did you, why did you send me back? And, you know, or doctors resuscitating somebody, why did you bring me back? And because the light is everything and the world is nothing. And so you might have that question come to mind when you are in everything and you come back to nothing. Why? <laughs> but there's always something to clear away. There's more to clear away. It's an unconscious mind of repressed darkness. And that is that is the answer. There really is no here and there, but while you believe there is a here and there, then there's more darkness to be undone, raised up to the light and so forth. So after those revelatory experiences, that's the time when I would say those light experiences, those revelatory experiences were so convincing that at that point I thought, okay, now I don't really have any ambition left. I mean, those, yeah. it, going into the light, that will take away uh, your ambition to okay. succeed in this world. When you start to realize it's a hoax yeah. and you've had a direct experience of the truth, or a glimpse, you might say, a strong glimpse. And three of them, it was almost like Jesus is like, oh, how do you get it? What this is about, this is about transcending the world. This isn't about making the world a better place. This isn't about fixing anything in the world. This is about Lesson 23, workbook. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. Are you willing to give up grievances? Are you willing to get out? The experiences were so strong and that did launch me into, remember that first lesson of the Holy Spirit in the, in the text, uh, to have, give all to all. Suddenly there's a motive. It's not like the ego going, oh right, give all to all. Yeah, and you'll be broke. You just go out there and give all to all and you'll be broke. No, this was the light saying, be a giver. You know, you have to, you have to, be like Gandhi, be like Mother Teresa, be like Jesus, like Buddha. You have to be, you have to demonstrate this. You have to be, get into true generosity, you have to give. 
And so, instead of having a career, instead of having a family, instead of having all the things that the world kind of holds up as, you know, the goodies, uh, it was Jesus saying, be a living demonstration of this I amness. That's how people get clued into it, not through the words. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Course is, a, is amazing with its words, but Jesus tells us that words are symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So we need to go way beyond the words. We need to go into the actual living experience of this for it to have a maximum impact. You can't just be good with the words, you have to actually be a demonstration of that. And so, that's when I kind of turned to Jesus and I said, okay, I need to learn how to give. And he said, that's right, you need to learn how to give as God gives. God doesn't have any reciprocity. God isn't asking for anything back. God is giving out of all love, and God only knows giving. And that's the kind of giving you need to get into. Giving as if you see that it's, it's all that there is. Giving to see that what I give is what I receive. You don't give to get, you give to spiritually receive your, your daily bread, your nourishment that comes from God. So, that's, first I was in my hermitage and people started to come and visit me up there. From, I would go down to course groups in Lexington, Kentucky, about, I don't know, maybe an hour and 15 minutes away, go to Unity churches, start to share. The personality of David was extremely shy. I was voted most quiet in my senior class. So, this is how God works. Moses stutters. And God's like, oh, you'll be perfect to deliver these Ten Commandments. And who's this shy guy over here from Cincinnati, Ohio, who's voted most quiet in his senior class? Oh, he'll be perfect as my spokesperson, my worldwide spokesperson for A Course in Miracles. This is why, you know, with God all things are possible. God isn't interested in the excuses and Oh, maybe you got the wrong person, or you don't know me, I can't do this. No, God is like, actually, the Christ is in everyone, and we have to draw it out of them. We have to help them see that they're the living Christ. And you can only do that by being the living Christ. So, I went from being very, very shy to hearing Jesus within me, not so much a verbal voice, but this train of thought, where to go, what to do, who to call, you know, God's voice speaks to me all through the day, yep, he's like, get that right, I'm here and I'm, to those whom much is given, much will be required, from the Bible, and, and I had no idea what that meant, I, I had no idea what I was getting into. You give yourself over to Spirit, and the Spirit's like, Thank you very much. <laughs> now, let's get busy. <laughs> like, so, at the beginning, when I, after I was studying the Course at the very, very beginning, I went from just studying it alone and tuning in and using it almost like just an oracle to tune in with, with Jesus, to going, I went from zero to five Course groups a week. Talk about like these cars that go from zero to fifty in so many seconds. As soon as I gave myself and said, use me, then suddenly the shy guy, going off, going to course groups, speaking up in course groups. I went to one Course in Miracles group in Cincinnati that we met on Tuesday, Tuesday nights at this woman's house, Kay Copeland. Uh, she opened up her house like you're doing here for like a course group of maybe 20, 25, 30 people every Tuesday night. And I would pray to Jesus, and he'd say, go to this group, and I would go there, and it was, it was a typical study group where they all went around the room and they read from the Course, and read a paragraph or two, and then the next one. It was a Course study group. And I go in there, and, and I knew that of those 25 people were struggling, they were hurting, and Jesus, of course, knows what's going on in everybody's lives, and so, 
Sometimes we'd go through reading the book and then somebody would start crying or break down or have something that they're just having trouble facing. And then Jesus would come through me and tell them in very comforting, nurturing ways, helpful things in their life. Whether it was a, an emotional difficulty, a suicidal thoughts, or fear around money and economics, or boyfriend, girlfriend issues, or whatever, it didn't really matter. Jesus started to speak through me. And it was one thing for Jesus to speak to me, <laughs> or in my mind, but then if you're shy, you know, my parents had always said, when you grow up, don't speak about God or politics in public. <laughs> so, it was the old condition. <laughs> don't speak about God when you're in a group. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a personal thing. Don't, don't speak about it. And now Jesus is like, well, actually I'm in charge of the Planet of the Atonement. And I don't care if you think you're shy or not. We've got some words to be spoken that will wash away this self-concept that you believe you are and open you up to who you truly are. So, I would speak up, I would just wait till Jesus would have me speak up in the course group and then he would do it. And he started to do it more and more often. This was like a course group with no facilitator. So, you read the book and then there's pauses and quiets and opening and emotions coming out and people calling out for help, which was perfect for Jesus then to come through and, and help, where there was a call for help. But, after this went on for uh, some time, maybe a year and a half or something, it was a very funny looking course group because they have continued to go around, no facilitator, read the course, and then as soon as somebody had a question, all 25 heads <laughs> would turn <laughs> to the body of David to hear what the Spirit had to say. This is a very unusual course group. When, when you've got that much connection with Jesus, and there's no facilitator, and it's a course study group, but people had questions about the course, they had questions about their lives, and so therefore it would be a stop, and then all the heads would turn like, and? You know, so I was kind of like, Without trying to be, I was starting to turn into, it looked almost like an oracle, the oracle of the course group or something. And this went on for a while because, of course too, I, I had uh, been up to Roscoe with, with Ken and Gloria and uh, had, I, I did what most course students might want to do, where I, I spent hundreds of hours immersing in Course in Miracles teachers. Mm -hmm. So I would immerse into like Ken Wapnick for example for hundreds and hundreds of hours and, and different ones. But there was one difference is I had Jesus in my mind mm -hmm. giving me commentary on Ken's teachings even. Where he would say, good point, remember this. Oh, there's a little bit of level confusion here. Uh, this you should, you know, I had Jesus commenting on the best Course in Miracles teachers. You read Return to Love, you get Jesus' commentary on the ideas of Return to Love. Regardless of, okay, Marianne wrote that, Ken Wapnick wrote uh, Jesus and Forgiveness. Different, Tara Singh wrote Nothing Real Can Be Threatened. So as I would watch videos, listen to audios, or read books, which I, I was determined to get all the way back to the light. So I was going to make use of all the great teachings and teachers of this world, and I had the commentator, Jesus, in my mind telling me, don't forget this. Turn the page, you'll see there's another good example of what I'm talking about here. So it was, this was an acceleration in working with A Course in Miracles because of the interconnection. And, of course, I also went around, I mean, I, my first, I started tra traveling in 1991, and in that particular trip, I was out in uh, in Sedona with Robert Perry and his wife at the time, Susan. I was with Beverly Hutchinson and her mother at the time when she was living in in, uh, in Los Angeles. I was with uh, I stopped off at the back then it was California Miracle Center before it became Community Miracle Center, and I went up to San Francisco. I was there. 
So Jesus, Jesus had me over to, some of you might have heard of Endeavor Academy. There was, before there was Endeavor Academy that was called God's Country Place in Wisconsin, Jesus had me making the rounds. He didn't care whether they were called <laughs> authors or master teachers or gurus or whatever. There I was, there I was, and with this voice in my mind, helping me do what? Come to greater discernment, mm -hmm. greater clarity. Isn't that what all of us are doing when we read books? Isn't that what we're doing when we go to seminars and lectures? We're, we're feeling what resonates. We're praying, we're asking, help me, show me. I don't want to, this ego thing is clever. So if I'm going to escape this very clever, ingenious ego, then I'm going to have to be really super willing to learn how to discern, how to discern with you, Holy Spirit, with you, Jesus. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are, are the ones who sponsor revelation. You know, they can bring down the light because they, they are the light. They are our connection with God. They aren't people like authors and seminar leaders and so on and so forth. Those are just symbols that they can use but in order to go into this revelatory light, it has to come from an awakened mind, and, and that's what the Holy Spirit, that's what Jesus are. They have completely, this is the transcendence of time and space. They're the ones that bring the revelation. And they're the ones that, that you need to tune into for that guidance, you know, because they're the ones, that's that small still voice inside that, that will never let you down, will never abandon you, will never leave you will always give it to you straight, even if the ego doesn't want to hear the guidance, and even if the guidance is, the ego says, forget that, they will come back with it and say, no, this is for you, this is for you. So, after five years with, of intimate experience with the Course, of, um, of getting into having revelation experiences, having enormously mind-expanding experiences. Um, after five years, David was thinking, okay, things are going good, I'm, I am loving this, this is like the fast track, and Jesus is like, no, this isn't the fast track. I'll show you the fast track. <laughs> you think all of that, going to visit Ken was the fast track, reading the Course for eight hours, doing your meditations, and this and that. Oh yeah, you had a few revelations. Huh? You want the fast track? Yeah. I'll show you the fast track. He said, we're going on a road trip. David did not like the trip. <laughs> David was not, David was one of those kids that go with mom and dad as a child and across the United States, are we there yet? <laughs> and David's mother was one of those mothers I see something that you don't see, and the color of it is red. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and my sister, we both like. <laughs> it got to the point that we hated travel so much. My sister, interesting, my sister's first name and my sister's middle name are the, the parents of Jesus, Mary and Joe. <laughs> my sister. A father named John and Eve, Evelyn. Was my mother's name? It's like talk about central casting, having fun. <laughs> Eve, John, Mary, Joe, and David. I was named after King David of the Bible, the Psalms. So is my brother. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. Yeah, that's what I was named after. So all these symbols going, and I'm like, "What do you mean?" And he's like, "We're hitting the road." Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but actually traveling is a good mechanism to let go of the self-concept, because all your comforts, your conveniences, all your preferences are in your face every day when you're on the road. Mm -hmm. This was not like a road trip where he took me from Ramada to Holiday Inn <laughs> to, you know, all these fancy... No, no, this was like hit the road, he gave me, I just had this little bit of money came in, he said, he, took, he guided me to a car dealership and he said, you're going to buy a little uh, spirit car, a little gold spirit car, three cylinder car, and that's what we're going traveling in. It wasn't a Cadillac, it wasn't a like, 
Yeah. Mercedes Benz, Rolls Royce was just a tiny little three cylinder little car <laughs> that I got at a used car lot. And then off on the road, and I mean, when you go traveling with Jesus, <laughs> whoo, you know, where are we going? I will tell you. <laughs> okay. So, where are we going to start here? He said, go west. I said, west from Cincinnati? <laughs> yes. So, off we go. First night out, I think I got, I got down to uh, a, t a town in Oklahoma. No, I, there was the first night, it was over near St. Louis, then Oklahoma. I'm at a campground in Oklahoma, there's a blind man who's singing, and all these people are gathered around, and Jesus is having so much fun with me because I don't like to travel, and he's got me on the road, uh, and who knows where for who knows how long. Who knows how long? Yeah, that road trip ended, that road trip started in 1991, and it ended in 1996. He took me out on the road on like Australian walkabout, you know, the, you know, the Aborigines go out, with a, how helpful that is for the walkabout to find mm -hmm. food, you know, to telepathically, Marla Morgan's book, you know, some of you read Mutant Message Down Under. He took me on a five year United States and Canada road trip. Five years of you will listen to me, I will tell you everything you need to know. I will tell you, but where am I going to stay? Yeah, that's going to be fun. You follow me. I remember thinking like, that's crazy. You can't travel in the United States of America without a plan, without places to stay. Where's all the money going to come from? He didn't tell me, of course, I was going to be on the road for five years. And so he took me on a, instead of a walkabout, a rideabout. I was riding a driveabout. Course in Miracles groups, churches, unity churches, speaking through me. Where's it all, where's the funding going to come? Oh, from donations. Donations, you know. What happens if you've been raised with the Protestant work ethic? <laughs> of you earn your money, you save your money, and you spend your money. And now Jesus is like, if you'll be a miracle for me, I will arrange time and space for you. Did any of us hear that growing up from our parents? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that as a teenager saying to your parents, I'm not so sure I'm excited about study or university or college or anything, or earning or learning a, a skill to survive. I think I'm going to be a miracle worker for Jesus, and Jesus will arrange time and space for me. That will get you locked up. I mean, I know with my parents, if I had said anything like that, that would have got me locked up. We're right to the psychiatrist, right there. But this was already now with that connection with Jesus, that actually helped because when I would pull into a like a, a hostel, to sleep for like $10 or $12, whatever. I didn't have a lot of money, but I would go there, and then Jesus would say, see that woman over there? After I walk in, and I'd say, yeah. He said, tomorrow morning you're going to have breakfast with her, and you're going to have a great holy encounter. He would give me a little bit of heads up. So, I, so the next day I'd go, okay, I'm willing. And then I'd go, and the next morning, guess who was there at the hostel fixing mm -hmm. breakfast? The same woman. I go over and say hi, we sit down, we have this deep orchestrated spiritual talk where Jesus was like setting up all the encounters. Setting up everything that I would need to teach what I would learn. And the big thing was arranging it all. Arranging the travel, arranging where I would sleep, arranging everything. So what was this five years except for me to tune into guidance to really become God dependent and not David past learning dependent. I learned a lot in 10 years of university. You know, there was a lot in there. And Jesus was like, yeah, we've got a lot to unlearn. 10 years of, of worldly learning now. 
got to go through and unlearn it all, just so you can listen and follow me. So then, that got exciting, I'm on the road, I, you're going to meet this one, this would happen. People started inviting me into their homes, stay a while, what do you need? Uh, the biggest issue I had in those first six months or that first year of on, being on the road with Jesus was was my past learning of refusing things. Mm -hmm. You know, people offering things. They would offer, offer, offer things to me. And I would say, oh, thank you, but no thank you, no thank you. You know, it was the old, I can take care of myself yeah. mentality that yeah. what all of us have been raised with, right? Take care, look out for number one. Use your education, learn, learn your skills. Nobody else is going to take care of you. Jesus is like, I'll take care of you. Now let's unlearn this independent, autonomous self that thinks it can handle everything on its own, egoically. Because it's not being dependent on like food stamps or the system or whatever, but it's also not being dependent on the pride of thinking you have education and skills, and that you personally are surviving based on your own way of, of living. So you see, the pride has to get undone, and that's why it's almost like Jesus was saying, you know, you think you've come so far in these first five years with the Course, but you've still got a chip on your shoulder, and that chip on your shoulder is pride. You still think you personally know how to take care of yourself, when that pride is holding you back from the light. It's still relying on past learning. It's still relying on past associations. It's not really the, the truth that will set you free, it's still thinking you're doing it personally and, and still having too much control. And, and how are you going to realize the world's an illusion if you think you're in charge? If you think like that Frank Sinatra song, I got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow, got the string around my finger. You know, if you're going to play this autonomous person who's got all these skills and who's in all this learning and who's in charge of everything, how are you going to be the light of the world? How are you going to be humble if you think you personally did it all? You personally learned how to survive. I said, but that was a lot of work. Ten years, you know how many, ten years of university on top of, of high school, on top of grade school. I said, that's like 22 years of work, Jesus. And he's like, yeah, that's blocking you from the light. Mm -hmm. You need to learn some humbleness. You need to, have to learn how to listen and follow, because that worldly learning has just meant that you've learned how to adapt and adjust to a world that the ego invented. You are very adaptive to a crazy world, which makes you crazy. <laughs> What do you mean, I'm, I'm not crazy? Yes, you're psychotic. Wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus, I am not psychotic. I, am, I know a lot of things, but I am definitely not psychotic. He said, go back to your days in psychology. What's the definition of psychosis? Psychosis is a break from reality. He said, the kingdom of heaven, nirvana, love, light, that is reality. And you dreaming that you're separate from God, and separate from love, is a break from reality. So you and all the other six, six and a half billion at the time, have got a psychosis going on. A major case of psychosis. You've had a psychotic break from God, and you're not even acknowledging that. To use the Paul Simon's phrase, you believe you're gliding down the highway, when in fact you're slip sliding away. <laughs> you, you have slip slid away from God, and you don't even recognize it. But you're not only psychotic, you're schizophrenic. I said, what's schizophrenic? He said, you tell me, psychologist. <laughs> schizophrenic when you hear multiple voices. <laughs> what do you think you're listening to every day with all your interactions with your fellow human beings? But many voices. Not one voice. Not the voice of the Holy Spirit. The one voice that can help you, you ignore. And you pay attention <laughs> to all of these schizophrenic multiple voices. So, this was one of those kind of things where I started to have a humbling experience, was like, wow, everything that I thought 
was good and helpful in terms of this world was actually a block. Mm -hmm. And I said, how can it be that I, I was that mistaken? Mm -hmm. That I thought I was gliding down the highway when in fact I was slip sliding away. He said, well, the world is upside down and backwards. Mm -hmm. You cannot judge your advances from your retreats. The things in this world that you think, where you think you've been the biggest failure have been times when you're cracking open like Humpty Dumpty. You're having that big fall and the Holy Spirit can put all the pieces back together again into holistic perception and show you a happy dream, the real world, but you have to be humble and let it fall away. The times when you think you've failed the most were the times when you had the greatest opportunities yes. for healing. And the times when you think you were succeeding in the world, where you just got that new promotion, that new car, that new boyfriend or girlfriend, that new this, you know, and you were gloating over your achievement or your accomplishment, those are the times when you were slipping back away from the light. And the ego was, was cheering you on, going, you're making it, you're going to have a separate, unique, autonomous identity, then you'll forget about God forever. Good for you, great promotion. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful car? I remember when I was in, uh, when I was in uh, university, and I was at the University of Cincinnati, and I was studying engineering, and when I was a kid, I, you know, we had fantasies, we have different things we look on in the world. We think, oh, when I grow up, I'm going to live in a house like that, or have a partner like this, or have to drive a car like this. I remember when I was a kid, on the way to church, we would pass a Lincoln Mercury dealership. And when we would drive by, my eyeballs were out there on the side of the car. I wasn't so thrilled about going to church, but I really liked that, that drive past that Lincoln Mercury dealership because Lincoln Mercury had put out a, a car. Remember how Ford had the Mustang? Lincoln Mercury had the Cougar XR7. And those were those, those turn signals that went, you know, that moved. That was the Cougar XR7. That was back, well, maybe 12 years old or something, looking at that. So I get into university, and the first time I have enough money to buy a used car, what kind of car do you think I went out and bought? I went out and bought a Cougar XR7. That was very important for David's self-concept, to, to drive. It didn't matter if it was a used Cougar XR7, it was a beautiful Cougar X with a little turn signal. So anyway, I was taking a couple friends down part of a, a design, art, and architecture class I was taking at the time. And I was coming back up from downtown Cincinnati. We just bought some art supplies or whatever. And I was sitting at a red light with a couple cars in front of me, waiting. And I looked in my rearview mirror, and there was a car approaching from behind at a great velocity, like a missile or a bullet. And I think after my car was smashed and from the rear and total, <coughs> and the the man who said, oh, he said, I was, I'm sorry, I was looking at the children playing in the park. I didn't even see you. Mm -hmm. So, it, and I remember, the car was demolished. I remember talking to the insurance agent, and they said, no, you bought that. It's a used car, and your insurance won't even cover the replacement of that car. And I remember how sad I was at the time, like. Cougar XR7 has just been demolished. And then I remember praying, this was prior to the course, just praying and praying like, this is, oh, this is so terrible, God, this is terrible. And, and then I remember going in to see my career placement counselor. But before I went into him, I had this epiphany that the reason I was so sad about this car being demolished is because my identity and my self-concept was too wrapped up in that car. That's why I was sad. It wasn't because of what happened, it was because my attachment to the car, the fantasy of that car, I was disappointing myself by having an identity that was all wrapped up in a Cougar XR7. So I had this epiphany, and I went in to tell my, my counselor, I said, I just had the most amazing experience. I 
my car was totaled and I realized it was, it was an identity attachment. My counselor just shook his head and said, you should be sad. You should be sad. And I was like, oh. <laughs> he doesn't see my epiphany. And then later I, I thought, he doesn't see my epiphany. And then I said, that's another insight. That when you have epiphanies, you can't just go run around and tell everybody about your epiphanies. Because... They aren't ready to hear it. And if they aren't ready to hear it, see it. I was like, wow, that's a double blessing. My car was demolished. I realized it was an identity attachment. And I realized I couldn't talk about it. So, this was before the course. I called it BC. This was back in the BC days. But I was still back in BC days. But I was very excited about what I learned. My discoveries. And... Jesus tells us in the Course, there's the stages of the development of trust, and I think it's the second stage where Jesus says, it will seem as if things are being taken away from you. That's actually one of the stages of the development of trust. He says, it's not actually that anything's really being taken away from you, it's just that you're starting to re realize that certain things don't have value. You're valuing your peace of mind more than you are the things. And then you don't need the things anymore when you start to see that your peace of mind isn't dependent on the things. Well, that will, those kind of realizations, you can tell that's a, a stage of trust because the more you realize you can have the peace of mind from, from the forgiveness within and you don't need the stuff to make you happy. You don't need the stuff, the credentials, all the things of the world to give you that fulfillment, that happiness, that joy and that peace. That's a major spiritual advance. At the time, I was brand new, I was, you know, at first it's, you, you mourn these things and then all of a sudden you have your epiphanies and you go, oh my gosh, this was actually working together for my good. And then you start to realize things don't happen to you. Everything that seems to happen in your dreamscape is happening for you. But there's nothing ever, 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 ever happening against you. It's all happening for your mind to wake up. That's a huge realization that everything's happening for you. Especially because when we get relationships, heartbreaking relationships, physical seeming illness, even though it's just symptoms that are selected by the mind, by the wrong mind, there's all kinds of things that happen that the ego judges as horrific. The huge, huge tragedies, and then the deeper you go spiritually, you start to realize, oh, thank you Spirit, you were looking out for my peace of mind, for my awakening with every single step that I seem to take in time and space. You are always there saying, there is another way to look at this. You were always there saying, I could see peace instead of this. You always, there was always a blessing there for you, even if you didn't see it. There was a blessing. And now you're starting to see that the blessing extends forever and ever and ever. When you really follow this pathway, you start to have deeper states of peace of mind that come in, more long-lasting peace. You start to go through things. I was, somebody did want me to do a pre-interview to go on this show called um, Coast to Coast. And they said, David, it's a good way, you can sell your books and you can move that needle and go on Coast to Coast, but you have to do a pre-interview. I don't know whether I failed the pre-interview or what, but I never got a call back. I was talking about breatharianism, I was talking about transcendence, joy, I told the lady who was interviewing me, I hadn't had a bad day in 20 years. And she said, what? Maybe I, my joy was a little over the top. But I'm not into career. I'm not into pushing books. I'm not into, I don't have a, a something that I'm trying to make, manifest. In fact, people come to me and they talk about manifesting. I say, well actually, if you really go deep enough with the Course, it teaches you the impossibility of manifesting. Because spirit doesn't come into matter, and you can only bring 
the darkness to the light. You can't bring the light into the darkness. And they're like, that, David, don't, don't do that. Don't you go and do <clears throat> seminars and workshops on the impossibility of, mastering, of, of manifesting. But the thing is, these are all symbols along the way. They can be used by the Holy Spirit to show the power of your mind. And anything that shows you the power of your mind is helpful. Mm -hmm. But then, it goes deeper. You know, it goes... I remember I did a talk one time in Michigan where I did the first half of the talk and then during the break a woman came up to me and she said, I manifest. She said, I can manifest anything. Houses, cars, soulmates. They call me the manifesting lady. I can manifest anything. And during the break she was talking to me and I said, that's wonderful. I said, you, when I get back here in the second half, I'm going to have you come up and I'm going to have you tell all your miracles of manifesting. Just share for everybody. Because I knew it would be a very powerful, impactful talk for the whole room. Because a lot of people in the room were very much into lack and everything. So I said, you just come, we'll spend the first 15 minutes, you give all your manifesting miracles and then I'll take it deeper after that. And that's what we did. So she showed up, told all of her miracles, and then I went into what Jesus dictated this uh, booklet called The Song of Prayer. Mm -hmm. And where, you know, you go, the deeper you go up the ladder of prayer, it more comes down to the highest prayer you can give is, Father, what is your will for me? Mm -hmm. and, and that, the highest prayer that you can offer, doesn't involve stuff. It involves your will. Your free will, your happiness, God's will for me is perfect happiness. That's, that's what that's the highest rung is about. But that's how generous the Spirit is. The Spirit always is using everything to point to the highest. It does, it's not trying to take anything away, because it's only a belief that we have things in this world is where the suffering. And then we believe we have to maintain them, and it's a lot of work, and we, you know, we get into all the the guilt and the struggle of trying to maintain a self-concept, when actually Spirit wants us to go higher and higher towards the light, you know, to really see how unlimited that we really are. So, why not, I'd love to open it up, um, because that's part of the fun of it all for me, is that we all have the answers inside, and that questions that you have, are really everyone's questions. We're doing this, you know, that's why I sometimes record these. Gabrielle was asking me if I was going to record today. So I can push the button there. But our, one question is everyone's question. Yeah. Everything we're going through is for everybody. So there's a hand <laughs> in the back. Uh, uh, since we're, you know, you're doing a talk on trust, um, and you're such a great demonstration, what are some of the things Yeah, but thank you. The first thing I think that comes to mind is this idea of, um, I remember when I read Ken Wapnick's book, Absence from Felicity. Mm -hmm. And I was quite fascinated at the time to look about how Jesus was working with Helen Shuckman. Because I figured Helen and Bill were the first two Course in Miracles students on the planet, so how, how better to start to learn about trust, learn about guidance, learn about the way Jesus works with us than by really reading about that. So when I was reading about Helen wanting a, a used Borgana coat for a certain amount of money in New York City, and Jesus guiding her and directly taking her to the store where she could get a used Borgana coat for the amount of money that she wanted to pay, I was like, that was impressive. I was like, wow. That, that tells me a lot about the power of prayer. And how Jesus, some people say, well Jesus is not interested in Borgana coats and everything. Well, Jesus is interested in dictating his course in miracles through the scribe and saving time 
And that is a classic example of how prayer and trust and guidance can save time, not only for Helen, but for her task that she had of scribing in Course in Miracles. That blessed all of us. Mm -hmm. That Borgana coat that was used at that particular, for that price, was actually a time saver for all of us, mm -hmm. so she could spend her time working on A Course in Miracles. So, I would say that the main thing with trust is, is that when we pray, the prayer, we have to really be honest and look at the parameters of the prayer. Like Jesus did with Helen, and said, like if you said, find me a Borgana coat, this price, and so on and so forth, I can, I can get help guide you for that, but if you wanted to save even more time, you could change the prayer to, what is the best coat for me here now? You see, take the parameters of the Borgana, of the price range, and that's for all of us, Jesus says, it's not that you ask for too much, it's that you ask for far too little. Mm -hmm. And the reason we limit our prayers is we put these demands and these parameters on our prayer, and then that actually doesn't save us time, it actually takes more time. Those are called preferences, you know, the more ego preferences that we have, our prayer should be to, to be washed away of those preferences and to be able to say, here I am Lord, what is best for me today? That would be like mm -hmm. a prayer, that, that's like a prayer to open the day. But a lot of times we have a lot of specific preferences which is coming from our ego self-concept and the Spirit will work with everything. It doesn't matter what we offer up. But I was fascinated to read Absence from Felicity and go, wow, Jesus, is, this is really about saving time for all of us. If there's only one of us, and we're just waking up to the realization that there's only one of us, then what would help save time for everyone? What would be the help speed up the awakening for everybody? That's what guidance is about and prayer. <coughs> also, I think, Sometimes people get, they really think they have to know how the guidance will come, so sometimes people want to hear a voice, but they don't. Or they want to uh, journal, but nothing comes or something. I think with guidance, and which builds trust, the more we are successful with experiencing guidance and following it and seeing the benefits of guidance, that's a great speed up for all of us, but I do feel like for me, I think one of my early prayers way, way, way back was, I was just praying to God, reach me, please reach me, any way that you can. Reach me through music, reach me through bumper stickers, billboards, talking to my mother, talking to a person on the street, you know, I want to, to you to reach me in whatever way that's possible. I don't want to be limited in my reception of, of your guidance in my life. Because at the beginning, before I read the Course for those eight hours and used it, I, I, I just tried to be as open-minded as I could to the guidance coming in, in, in ways that I maybe didn't think that it was possible. Mm -hmm. Because the more I opened up, I started to see that guidance was coming to me all through the day in all kinds of different ways. But I didn't, I had my blinders on, because I had thoughts about this is the way the guidance has to look, and this is the way it has, the form it has to take. So when we have these preferences around the form, that can really hold back the trust, the development of trust. Um, <clears throat> I also have found, I've had so many encounters with people, and they've told me so many stories where they would pray. I, could, I had one friend that I met up in Roscoe, New York, up at Ken and Gloria's Place Foundation up there when they were over on the, that coast, and, and she always had an issue with education. She always felt very unworthy about her education, that she never graduated from high school, the equivalent over there in England, and she was very insecure about her education. And then when she needed a job one time, she prayed to the Spirit to, to 
have a job offer come her way. And, and when she prayed that prayer, the first job that she was offered was, was at a school. And this is the way, to me, the Spirit works. The Spirit's always looking at, at what experience what symbols can be used to unwind your insecurities, your fears, your doubts? And it's not always the thing that the ego wants. You know, when you pray for a job, the ego may have in mind the kind of job that it would like. The pay, the perks, the hours, you know, that's the way the ego thinks. And then the Holy Spirit's always thinking, hmm, what kind of experience will really <laughs> help bring in humbleness and wash away fears and doubt and insecurity. You see, that's the difference between the ego and the spirit. The spirit wants you to dissolve the self-concept to come back to the light. The ego wants you to build <laughs> the self-concept, build the pride. One time uh, I trained to be a tennis pro professional and a tennis instructor, and uh, <clears throat> But before that, I was actually so interested in tennis, but the ego was interested in tennis. The ego was interested in raising the skill level, becoming a great player, and all these different things. And I do remember, I had this experience where I prayed, and I said, please, I'm going up to the tennis court right now, and I want you to bring someone up there who has a very high skill level that will that will offer to hit with me, because I know if I go to that tennis court and this tennis player is really good and they say, come on and hit with me, that that will help raise my skill level. So I prayed to Jesus, I said, please, you know, I'm going up to the tennis court. So I got to the tennis court, the tennis courts were completely empty. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm. So I said, well, at least there's a, a one of those wooden boards that you can hit. Yeah. At least I'll build these skills here, you know, hit against the board. So as soon as I'm hitting against the board for like 10 minutes, waiting for my great tennis player to show up and hit with, rally with me and teach me things and everything, I look and there's a little boy that can hardly hold a racket. He's so small. And he comes rolling up and I'm like, <laughs> like this. And then he's like carrying, you could barely carry the racket. And he comes up, Mister, would you hit with me? <laughs> now that's the perfect example of how Jesus works <laughs> to humble you. And I said, like, Yes, yes, I could see what this is all about. It was about humbly seeing the Christ in everyone that comes to you. And the ego had the whole situation figured out to improve the skills. I had plenty of opportunities after that, and I did have many, I had a dear friend who was into Yogananda and self-realization and Kriya Yoga, and years later we would get out of the tennis court, and we would rally for hours. I mean, we were so relaxed, we were using the tennis as like a, as like a Tai Chi, a movement meditation where we would rally for hours, and our skill level, it was like Jimmy Connors and Bjorn Borg out there. We were so relaxed. He was into Korea meditation and self-realization. I was into Course in Miracles and self-realization. And the Spirit used that tennis. So we were hitting top spin lobs and amazing shots. One time even, he, Spirit even used us to help transcend all of our thoughts about the environment because he invited me one day and I think it was like, there was like a foot and a half of snow in Cincinnati, and it was like a wind chill of like a minus five. And my friend, the Kriya Yoga guy, says, come on, let's go out and hit the ball. We had to go out there, shovel the tennis court. The balls would hardly come off the ground because it was so cold, they wouldn't bounce. He had a big mustache, which his nose was running, and so it was like <laughs> Niagara Falls frozen. Uh, when I look back at the photos, I'm thinking. And then Jesus had us out there going into rallies, getting into the zone, mm. the present moment, out there at five degrees below zero after we shoveled the snow, because we were letting all things be used for spiritual awakening. 
And that just shows you that that's another development of trust. Jesus will use the things that are already there. Like for me, I never really got into yoga, never got into Tai Chi, all the different things. I used the thing, Jesus used the things that I already had skills with to unwind my self-concept and take me into deeper states of meditation. For example, basketball. You know, in basketball, you can get into what they call the zone. Out here in LA, you've got LeBron now into the zone. You know, you just get into the flow where you let go of trying to control things and you get relaxed and then the skill levels go way up and you can go into some very high states of mind. I did that with basketball, with baseball, I did that with tennis, um, even running, jogging. You know, the Spirit used those things that I was interested in. That's the key point. The Spirit will use that which your ego is already interested in to undo the ego. You don't have to learn a bunch of new skills. The Jesus will use the things you already like. And then occasionally will use things that you don't like. Like for me, travel. <laughs> you know, that was one where Jesus is like, I'm going to really get you out of your comfort zone and your self-concept by using this mechanism of travel. And then you'll find out it's joyful. You'll, you'll actually find out under my guidance, travel can actually be fun, mm -hmm. joyful, exciting, but it has to be used for the purpose. That's what really builds the trust, is starting to get in touch with the purpose. Mm -hmm. Do we have a song? Yeah, sure. Do we could play? <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about this song, Share, Share Your Love. Share Your Love. Yeah. Um. It's a song that came to me when I, one morning I was kind of restless and I asked Jesus, what would you have me do? today. And then I heard this song in my mind. Mm -hmm. It was Jesus' answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Embrace yourself for me trust in me will set you free let me do everything through you there is nothing for you to do
Thank you for listening to my voice and for being the light of the world. Embrace yourself for me. Trust in me will set you free. Let me do everything through you. There is nothing for you to do. Share your heart for me. Share your smile with the whole world for me. For me. Share your love for me. Share your heart for me. Share your smile with the whole world for me. For me. Providence and um, yeah, some weeks ago actually Svava was on a uh, a TV show uh, with me and we were talking and uh, it was fun because I said oh I could feel Jesus saying use this opportunity because because the development of trust it has everything to do with your desire and your willingness <coughs> and not with time. For most of us, when we think about development of trust, we, even with those stages, it seems like, like, wow, this could be a, this could take me a long, long time to trust. Sometimes people even think of lifetimes, like, okay, not in this lifetime, but maybe after seven or eight more lifetimes, uh, I will be able to develop that trust. And all my talks are about what was mentioned earlier about the, the enlightenment is possible in this lifetime. It's a, it is very immediate to us, but it takes desire and it just takes a willingness. Uh, there were, are many passages where it talks about the little willingness in the Course, and then there was one passage where Jesus says it takes great willingness to learn that all outcomes, events, circumstances, situations are, are working together for your good. It takes great willingness. And that really opens us up into, wow, how guidance and development of trust go hand in hand. That your guidance, your intuition, that, that those prompts, those little nudges that you get, mm -hmm. those little things that are trying to get your attention are, are so very important because Following those builds your confidence. When, when I would follow a nudge or a little prompt or a little thing, and then I would have this joy, my heart would open up. I would start to feel this peace wash over me from following the guidance. Then I gained confidence in the guidance being leading the way instead of my past learning. And for most of us, you know, we try to be practical human beings, we try to be prudent, we try to be uh, 
do the best thing for ourselves and our friends and our families, but oftentimes it's just based on our past learning. You know, that's all we know. It's almost like, you know, asking a fish, you know, describe the air, you know, and it's like, what's that? You know, it's, it's so alien when you're so used to living in water that if you were asked about air, it's like, what is that? You know, I guess there could be a fish version of atheist, and some, an, an airiest who <laughs> doesn't believe in air. The fish, all the fish knows is water and, and is very doubtful about this thing called air. So, with Slava and I, it's kind of interesting because I've had so many, like over the years as I've traveled and I've had different friendships and people that have come into my life who are amazing singers and songwriters, and yet when I met Slava, she wasn't an amazing singer-songwriter. Most of the times I meet them and they're like, yeah, I'll go on the road with you and we'll, I'll share songs and everything like this, but but actually, um, was that how many years ago? Two or three? Two and a half? Two and a half years ago, I was going over to Holland mm -hmm. to do a five-day retreat and um, she was feeling very strongly Maybe you can share the story. You were feeling very strongly that you were to go to this retreat, but there were some hiccups along the way. Yeah. Yeah, well, I had only been studying the course for about six months when it just appeared on my computer screen. It was this retreat in Holland, and I was living in Denmark at that point. And I could just feel like I, I had to go there, like I had al already been mm. there. And, uh, but I had never traveled on my own, uh, so I was just in so much fear about it. Um, but I signed up, and then a week later, I was so afraid. I was, no, I'm not going to do it, and I tried to cancel. But I never heard back. <laughs> Jesus just took that email and threw away. Intercepted. Yeah, yeah. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to go. And I had everything planned out fly to Holland, I had to take two different trains and a bus, middle of nowhere, and I had planned everything, when I would land, what platform, this train, and there and there, and then the plane was delayed, so my whole plan just got wiped out, so I was praying, I was in so much fear on the plane, Jesus, you have to show me to change my mind about this, I, I don't know what to do, and suddenly when the plane landed, all this fear that was going through just flipped around and I was just so excited. I was just like, oh my God, I made it. And I was so happy. And I used to be very, very shy. Uh, doing this would be like <laughs> impossible for me. But uh, I just started asking people on the plane, um, please, could you help me? You have this address, I'm going to go there and there. And there was this guy who said, oh, my parents live there. And I had all the way, all these angels telling me where to go, where to buy a ticket, and, and all going with me to the bus, and putting me on the bus, and it was just a miraculous trip, just by praying, and... Because this, this, well, this was rural Holland, yeah. and it was nighttime, so she, you finally got off of, was it a bus or a train? It was a bus. It was a bus, bus yeah. dropped off in rural Holland, you don't speak <laughs> Dutch. And it's dark at night, and it's rural. You're out in the rural area. It's kind of in the vicinity now. Yeah, yeah. So what happened then? So I got off the bus, and uh, it was totally dark. And then I said to Jesus, okay, what now? And then I heard, turn around and knock on the door of the house behind you. And I turned around, and there was light. Um, looked like the living room. So I walked down there and knocked on the door, and uh, this elderly couple came open the door and didn't speak any English at all. And I had the address and they were just so loving and kind and they drew a map for me how to get up there. And the, and the man, he actually walked with me half the way and carried my bag. And yeah, it was just like, yeah, I was, it was like, oh my God, oh my God. This everything is just getting provided for me just by my willingness mm -hmm. to listen and follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So this is, that's kind of an example about how it's this journey is very different because we're used to relying on our past learning and things of the world. And, and when I first started with the course, which was 33 years ago, and then when I first started traveling, uh, I didn't have a cell phone, I, we, I didn't have GPS, I, I literally, uh, when I got the prompt from Jesus to, to, to start traveling and everything, I, at that point I didn't have a car, and then guidance came to go to this uh, car dealership and what money I had, I don't know, $2,500 or whatever, it's like, okay, there's the car, and I'm like, yeah, it's, go west, you know, wow. this car, and, and where's the gasoline going to come from, and, and where am I going to stay? And I mean, taking off with Jesus without money, it's like an adventure because it's like the Spirit is like saying, I'm, I'm going to provide for you. And yet it goes in the face of everything that we've ever learned, all our conditioning. And yet that's exactly what we call being under Christ's control, being directed. Mm -hmm. And those kind of things, once you can start to tune in and hear, then the miracles, it's going to take a lot of miracles to wash away the fear and the doubt. You know, we've had a lot of past experiences that would tell us that this cosmos and this place is a hostile place. You know, that you need to protect yourself, you need to guard, you need to be cautious, and so on and so forth. So, I would say that the development of the trust is the washing away of that fear and doubt. And if you're not relying on your past learning, then you do have to rely on something. Mm -hmm. So even when I tell that story of going out on, my, on the road from 1991 to 1996, I have had people write and they say, I tried to do what you did, and I, I got mugged <laughs> and uh, robbed, and you know, they'll, they'll write to me and I say, I never said do, <laughs> do what I'm doing. This is a course in mind training. This is a course in miracles. This is a course in building your confidence. This isn't a course of, of trying to do things and uh, even that part about, uh, you know, you, miracles sh should not be used to, to try to, uh, to convince anybody of anything. It's always for our own minds or for our own consciousness to develop comp confidence in our guidance. That's what it's all about. It's not, uh, it's not about um, trying to use miracles, you know, to induce belief. He talks about in the 50 Miracle Principles, where, you know, you're trying to, to convince somebody of something. It's always our own mind that is being convinced about, we can trust. It's safe to trust. So for myself, there were a lot of miracles. And also, I think with, with Slava's uh, experiences, um, she was telling me too, because she had barely been reading the Course, but when she was reading the Course, she was from Iceland, that's her first language, and then she was in Denmark, so Danish was her second language, and then as she's reading the Course in Danish, Jesus says, no, I want you to read the Course in English. Her third language, <laughs> imagine if you got a guidance, <laughs> if you were three languages, and your third language, and so she was like, going to Google Translate and slowly going through the book. It's a big book, but slowly. But the main thing there of that little parable was follow the guidance. The instruction was read the Course in English. And then all these songs, 60 songs have come from Jesus, all in English. Yes. You're in America, <laughs> in Southern California now, speaking to the group and these things. There, there is a plan for all of us for the awakening, but it may be very different mm -hmm. than you could conceive of or imagine. I know, as I went through those ten years of university, and I studied engineering, and urban planning, and psychology, and things, when the Course came, it was like Jesus was saying, okay, that was then, and now is now. And I've got you, I've got you by the hand, and I just want you to tune into me, and to just trust me and follow. And I said, okay, I, I can do that. 
and is there anything that will help build my trust? And he said, well, to the extent that you fall back on that past learning, to the extent that you already know better how to wake up, you know, the Course says you cannot wake yourself, but you can allow yourself to be wakened. Isn't that a powerful idea? You cannot wake yourself, but you can allow yourself to be awakened. Examples of trying to wake yourself may be, you know, reading a lot of spiritual books and doing a lot of things, that rituals that somebody else has told you will advance you. But when you really are humble and tune in and you, say, and you really say, in all honesty, wow, I don't even, can't even remember how I got here, I, how I got into time and space. There's been a pretty good amnesia going on around God and I really can recall the details of my worldly life, maybe even through past life regressions, even some past lives, but I don't know how the whole dark journey, the wandering in time and space even came about. And you don't really even have to know that. All you have to do is really have the willingness to, to follow that guidance. If you're wound in tight to illusions, then the, the solution would be to be unwound. And so for me it was like years of teaching the Course. I had people showing up in the 1990s, you are my teacher, I am your student. That was a surprise, but then I remembered the Manual for Teachers says that, oh, when the teacher is ready, the students will appear, you know, it's like, oh yeah, that's what this must be. These kind of things were always happening. And then I was, I was more of the traveling, talking mystic, and, and I didn't write books, but then over the years I had people wanting to, to transcribe the words that I'd spoken for many years, and then transcriptions came, and then books came. I didn't identify myself really as an author, but all of a sudden books started coming from the transcriptions, and then they're translating it into three different languages, and then into seven different languages, and then into twelve different languages. I'm just seeing it's all Jesus behind it. All I have to do is show up. All I have to do is say, here I am Lord. All I have to do is be willing to be used. That's all any of us need to do. It's really that simple. It's, it's what Christians kind of sometimes call almost like a conversion experience, but for me, it was like, okay, I'm willing to be used, and I give you my skills, I give you my the body, I give you possessions, I give you everything, and then I trust that you will use this for the benefit of the whole, for the benefit of everyone. That's what helped me get into this sense of giving. Where it wasn't a sense of trying to control or make something or make something happen. It was like very gentle, like just in my heart, a very sincere prayer of the heart. Like here, I give it all to you. And at the time I don't even think I even knew the full impact of giving, I give it all over to you. You know, we've heard those words. But for me, it was, I was really, like I placed my future in the hands of God, I really feel like I was giving over my future goals, my future ambitions, my future fantasies, my future mm -hmm. everything. No longer was I thinking about what kind of sports car I wanted. I wanted peace of mind. I wanted a happy, joyful, sense of free freedom. Uh, that's what I was praying for in my heart. And also with it came this prayer of, you know the way. I will, f I will but follow, you must direct me. And that's not a small thing because what it does is it kind of turns everything around in a proper perspective. Where, you know, you start to, to show up more and more and more without all these heavy expectations and mm -hmm. without all these time goals, you know, mm -hmm. that we're raised with. Where will you be in five years? Where will you be in ten years? You know, it, it is ex absolutely exhausting. And 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 I do have a bachelor's degree in urban planning. I even got a bachelor's degree in planning, <laughs> and then Jesus is like, oh, I can work with this, but you know, it's almost like, oh boy, planning. You know, it's like. 
could have studied theology or something about planning. You know, it was all based on using the past to project the future. And even when I was going through it for five years, you know, I had this feeling on the inside like, I'm never going to use any of this. I mean, I, I was going through the motions of completing something, but I had this strong feeling like it wasn't my life's calling. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's part of developing trust and really getting into what I call divine providence, is really having that heart-to-heart -heart talk in your mind with spirit to what is my calling. You know, that is no small thing. And, and when I say calling, it's more of a, of a sense of purpose within. It's not like you have to have a, a whole visual of everything that you're going to do in your life played out. If, when I was in high school, if somebody had showed me the way that the life of David would play out, I would have either laughed and went, you are crazy, I don't know who this guy is, but I don't know him, or I would have been very frightened, very, very frightened. If I had seen what would have played out in the decades after high school, I would have probably, it would have seemed like a nightmare, because from the shy self-concept, it would have been like, oh my God, what got a hold of <laughs> that guy, you know, without, without really having the experience and walking through it, moment by moment, building that trust, building that confidence, step by step. So, I really feel like, uh, I love sharing the metaphysics of the Course, I love sharing all the the miracles, how they relate, and that's why over the years when I've done counseling sessions, or I've, one time I was in Australia, I did like 38 counseling sessions in a row. I told the whole gang, I said, I'll do one-on-ones, and I had to do like five-minute counseling sessions. <laughs> it, was like, it was such a long line. But, but I do feel that, that that's the key, is, is how can we practically answer the call? We all are being called to a very holy function. And we call it by different names. But how do I answer that call? How do I turn myself over to that calling? And really embrace it. And then see the blessing of it, see the benefit. Because we don't want some kind of thing where somebody tells me what to do, uh, like in terms of like career planning or whatever. We want to discover that for ourselves. What lights my heart up? What brings me the greatest joy? Also for me, over the years, I remember Yogananda, before Yogananda passed away, he, he foresaw study groups, he foresaw communities. He, Yogananda was quite progressive and uh, he foresaw a lot of things that would assist us. We're used to you know, the nuclear family, we're used to certain configurations. Now a lot of people are, are basically very single, very autonomous, and still miserable. <laughs> still, whether you try to do it through the, the coupling, single, whatever, until you find that calling, until the, that calling inside of you activates and lights up, then there's still going to be a pretty strong denial of, of waking up. You know, there's still going to be quite some big loops in time and space until we get called. Somebody was asking me the other day, I think it was on a, a TV show or something, and, and they were saying, can you just simplify it for me? Can you, can you just give me the keys to trust? Like, I need some really good advice and some good keys to trust. And uh, I said, well, you know, there is one part of Lesson 135. Lesson 135 is the longest workbook lesson in the book. And there is a part where Jesus is kind of giving you how to be in this miraculous, joyful state of mind. Mm -hmm. And he says, you can stay there. You can stay there in this state of mind, basically, if, if you don't do these three things. So whenever <laughs> Jesus tells me, you know, you can really be in the joy of the miracle, that state of mind, but there's three things that you need to watch your mind very, very carefully for. And don't give in 
to any of these three things. I like it when it's very direct. Three things. So the woman was like, what are, what are those three things? <laughs> don't activate the past, don't organize the present, and don't plan the future. <laughs> That's it. I love that, when Jesus gets specific. I'm going through, I mean, I was raised with Jesus Christ, and then when we get to lesson 50 of the workbook of A Course in Miracles, all of a sudden Jesus, out of the blue, decides he's going to get really specific. I love it. I love it when Jesus gets specific. You know, I am with you always, even to the end of time. Too abstract. You know, Give me some specifics. So in lesson 50, you know, which is, I am sustained by the love of God, then he starts rattling off all these things and he says, in this world you believe you are sustained by everything but the love of God. He goes, with pills, money, protective clothing, being liked, knowing the right people. I love it when Jesus gets specific. Why? Because you can bring it home faster to your mind. You can start to go, okay, let me look at these. And then in Lesson 76, you know, I am under no laws but God's. Again, Jesus gets so specific. You know, he starts poking fun at money. He says, you really believe you would starve unless you had stacks of green paper strips and piles of metal disc? Ooh! <laughs> Good stuff. We don't have to get into an argument about capitalism. Jesus is going after currency. He's going after piles of metal disc and green, stacks of green paper strips. He says, you really believe that fluid pushed through a sharpened needle will ward off disease? Oh, he's going after the entire medical model. He's going after it all. You know, he goes after, you believe in the laws of economics. You know, the laws of medicine. He just, don't you love it when he is specific? Because it's those specifics that are believed in that are generating the guilt. It's those specifics that are believed in that are generating the fear. He redefines health as inner peace. And he says, it is with your thoughts alone that we must work. He's a metaphysician. He's an expert at going down into unconscious beliefs, at exposing attack thoughts, of, of exposing grievances, of using relationships, using movies, <coughs> using everything. And so, what I've discovered is, to me, when I was going with the Course, I, was, I wasn't looking for something beyond the Course. I know now I'm writing books and the extension of the Course and beyond the Course. I was looking at the practical application of doing what he said for me to do. Of using what he gave to me. Of trusting that he is the way, the truth, the life, and he is a time saver for me and for everyone. And, and to really go into it. And then once I went into the state of feeling joy and happiness and love, then, then it was just fun to extend it into things like the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. A lot of people I know, they're not so keen about spiritual practices. They, they say, oh, the practices are boring and they're tedious and they're saying, movies? What? You got a movie for me? What's a movie for? So I channeled the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment of how to use watching movies to go through this awakening process. It became very popular. Then it became an online program and now people all over the world are watching it. Not just the movies, but I, the Holy Spirit gives the commentary to set the movie up and then commentary during the movie. Oh, it's a very different way of looking at the movie when you have the Holy Spirit's commentary at the beginning and during the, the movie and at the end. People have actually, during those movie gatherings, have gone into mystical experiences in the middle or after a movie from the, the Holy Spirit's mm -hmm. use, Jesus' use of the movie. At one time I, like when I used to do these six week um, retreats over in Spain on this island, uh, Mallorca, basically, yeah, 
I would just show up and people would, we would have all kinds of collaborations and projects and things that we would do during the day and then I would, after dinner, I would just sit there at dinner time and ask Jesus, what movie are we all going to watch tonight? That's, that was my part. I just sat there by the pool all day and enjoying the Mediterranean and then, oh, oh you're on. It's, it's time to eat together, share a meal together and go deep into a mystical experience with a, with a great movie, a metaphysical movie. And so we would. That's what I would do for six weeks. <laughs> Sit there, do that, and then we'd go into the experience. So it's like with the movies, the music, with all kinds of things that people enjoy in this world, if they're just given over to the Spirit, you can take what is already enjoyable and then let it be used to lift your mind higher and higher and higher. To me, that's the, that's the practice of, of taking the Course and letting it be used. I'm going to be going up, we're just about at the break time here for lunch, but I'm going to be going up and visiting Judy Scutch, um, coming up here in about next, Friday, next, week. next week, next Friday. But mm -hmm. I remember she told me one time when she and Ken and Helen and Bill were there, <coughs> she received this, this information from Spirit that, that in many years to come, in centuries to come, the Course will become unrecognizable. And what it meant was that people would get into living it, sharing it, expressing it, the love would pour through us all as miracle workers, that it would, would not be what it starts off at the beginning, it starts off as a text, a workbook and a manual for teachers, but in one sense you could say the best is yet to come. And, uh, and so I feel like that's what my calling is, is really to take this all the way and to get into the depth of it, so that it, it can be a living experience, because that's what everybody is praying for and calling for. It's, we're good? We're good. Okay. We're awesome. And we're hungry. <laughs> and hungry, ready to go. Very good. So nice.